Hello, uh, welcome back. This is Alex. Yeah, I will be continuing on with uh, from the earlier part one. So in the last section, we talked about the front panel objects where I showed you a uh, front, uh, let view front panel has shown over here. So mainly you can be categorized into three main forms, decorations, customizable indicators, as well as customizable controls. So uh, let's go and explore and examine a bit more. So uh, in general, uh, let view front panels, uh, there are different types of uh, front panels uh, that can be created. Some are very uh, elaborate. So uh, I have one screenshot here to share with you. Uh, these are posted, contributed by uh, members uh, from the global LabVIEW community. Some of these very nice uh, GUI. Uh, and there are dozens of other LabVIEW front panels that were utilized by uh, SpaceX mission. Uh. And I think this photo is a photo credit by Elon Musk. Uh. So they actually have used uh, LabVIEW in some of their projects uh, for SpaceX. Uh. So uh, let's take a look. Now all front panel elements have uh, block diagram terminals. So maybe it's a good time now if you uh, after you have been uh, took, taken a while to uh, seated. So maybe now we is time to let's try it out. Can you launch your lab view? Uh, lab view. Okay. So let's try and do this together. I will also launch my lab view. Two zero one nine. Alright, so then we will have some uh, hands-on activity here. Okay, so with lab view, I would, uh, let me cancel this one first, and uh, I'll open a new VI. Okay, it's called the new VI. So I'm going to launch the new VI. Now, first thing what I would like to do is I would go to do a uh, Windows uh, tile left and right. Okay, maybe at the same time, I should also call my zoom it to. Yeah, okay, let's call this up. Okay, so I'm able to uh, zoom in. Right, okay. So first thing first, you can uh, try out is that you can try to randomly place some objects. Uh. So maybe I will just drop a few, uh, some controls and some indicators. Now, you what you can see is that in lab view, right, on the left hand side, here is called the uh, front panel. And on the right hand side here is called the block diagram. Now, as soon as you put the lab view uh, objects on the front panel, correspondingly, there will be another object that appears at the block diagram. Actually, they are referring to the same thing. Eh? Alright, so that is for this part. Now, let me also bring out one uh, pre-made uh, block diagram. Uh, lab view from, uh, sorry, lab view front panel, which I want to explain briefly. So as you can see on the over here, I'm going to go uh, in a clockwise fashion, uh, starting with this thing that I call box A. Uh. So uh, added some text comment as well. Now uh, in lab view, there are three main types of uh, palette. Okay, maybe I'll share with you the first one. If you uh, click under the view, right, you can see there is this thing called the uh, tools palette. So view tools palette. Right, so this tools palette is for us to basically uh, use it to do our editing, connect, uh, wiring up, and so on. So how do you can see that what I have on box one? Focus on box one first. Now what I have here is a horizontal slide, fill slide. All right, uh, and I also got things like meters, uh, thermometers, and so on, which you can try to get it as well. Now you can use the A tool here to do do some text editing. So for example, testing. Okay, so I am able to add in some text. As you can see over here, right? So this is the tool. Now this uh, second tool here. Okay, uh, please watch here. Okay, this is called the positioning tool or what I call the uh, arrow tool. Right, so I'm able to use the arrow tool and move my objects, eh? move my text and anything in the lab view. Alright, so these are some of the objects just to put it here for illustration purpose. Now, uh, moving along here, uh, I would also like you to share with you that if you observe carefully on my 
uh, top right hand corner here, right, we have the icons. Uh, this is called the lab view icon. You can always edit the icon. And also we have this thing called the uh, connector pin. Right. So connector pins are for us to later on use it to wire the inputs uh, and we can make things like a sub VI functions using the terminals inputs, much like your inputs and outputs for the for your VI itself. So we can also let's say right click and edit the icon. Okay, you can change the icon type. Okay, and also there's very cool uh, library types, different uh, glyphs uh, library you can edit your own icon and make an, a sub VI lah, just to share. Alright, so uh, okay, so that's for this part of this thing. I will call it the box B. Now moving on to box C, uh, I've actually uh, typed in some text here lah. So basically, these are just text ah. Yeah, I just edited here. Now we will to share this with you in, in a separate uh, Dropbox link lah, later on eh, at the end of the session. Lah. So uh, FP uh, is uh, the front panel is abbreviated by FP uh, and block diagram has BD lah, huh, in short. So there are three main elements, three main types of uh, palettes that we uh, always have to use. So number one is called the control palette. Control palette, how do I in get the control palette out? So what you saw earlier, this was called the tools palette. Huh? Now in order to get the control palette, it's very simple. You just right click on your mouse. So you see the word control here. Yeah, that is called the control palette. Maybe you can try everyone. You can right click on your mouse. So basically the control palettes allow you to drop the various types of objects. Okay, on your front panel design. Then I also share with you this thing called the tools palette. Uh. So this is a small tools palette which is very very handy. You must use them. Okay, and then of course uh there's this thing called the function palette, which I will show you shortly. Is look is located uh in, in the next uh, so called uh together with this program but let me show you in a short while so uh i'm moving on to this last box called the box e the the things that i want to share with you now control t is to uh toggle shortcut to tile the fp front panel and the block diagram side by side so maybe all of us can try that press the control and t all right so you can see that you can tile the uh front panel on my left hand side and also the block diagram on the right hand side and then you of course also have this thing called control e right uh, currently it's not obvious but if you uh, uh, so called make it full screen for your front panel you can toggle uh, let's say you press control e you can toggle between the two uh. all right then of course uh, if you want full screen right let's say for example if you want to bring the active uh, front panel of the block diagram to full screen you just press ctrl and backslash right ctrl backslash right to bring the uh sorry uh it's a forward slash i think ctrl and forward slash yeah forward slash okay ctrl forward slash to bring the uh thing to full screen so for, for example like this you can press that again and of course you can go back to con uh, ctrl t tile left and right so you have equal amount of spaces between the front panel and the block diagram okay uh, control slash uh. all right as you can see okay so these are some of the basic oh one more thing uh there's this thing called the uh, quick drop which is to press control space okay to call the quick drop so basically in quick drop right you can put in object uh functions or look for search for notes for example i want to look for this function called add right so you, you immediately uh, locate that function and then you can double click to drop the add function as you can see over here right so this is the add function by using the uh, control space uh, to get the quick drop key right so let me remove this okay so one more time to demonstrate press control space to bring out the quick drop function you can look for different functions for example uh, multiply okay you can uh, locate that function double click to call that function eh. right this is visible item can switch on the lip display so i managed to use control quick drop to get the fun the note that i want right 
So that is for the quick draw. Eh? Okay, so I think I will bring back my presentation slides over here. Alright, so what I have just shared with you is that uh, block diagram provides uh, access to the front panel values and also you can do uh, the code itself. So basically this part is the code coding and this part is the GUI. Alright, now moving along, uh, uh, there's this thing called the, what is data flow, uh, lab view data flow. Now data flow is a very important concept in lab view uh, and uh, we kind of understand that uh, in each block diagram, right, uh, there are different nodes. Uh. Nodes are different functions. For example, if you see in this simple diagram here, I have the add function, plus function, I've got the divide node, I've got the multiply, and I've got the subtract node, right? So generally, I think it's very clear that the, the final result or the formula result will be result in this, right? But, uh, so, but these are called, uh, these are arbitrary values. Uh. We just, uh, basically, it's a, floating point number uh, dbl or double float uh, double precision floating point number right so but what is trying to illustrate here is that um, the important concept is that uh, the node itself right in lab view uh, will only execute when there is data on the wire so this is the wire so if the data is present in the wire only then the node can execute so some terms here we call let view wires and we call these nodes uh. all right so data flows along a path defined by the wires and the nodes will only produce the output data after execution right and provided that the data are available okay at the node itself so the movement of the data will determine the execution order so generally speaking right if you look at these two for the uh, multiply and the subtract operations. Uh, now, both of them uh, can execute at the same time synchronously since they do not have any data dependency, right? So they, their data inputs are different. B, C, D, E are different. Eh? So the two nodes can execute simultaneously. So in fact, this is also a nice thing in lab view. There is this thing called the parallelism. Okay, parallelism in lab view. Eh? And it's one of the very important uh, lab view data flow paradigm that we must strictly observe uh, in lab view, right? So, uh, okay. So just now I mentioned about this thing called the function palette. Uh. Now, in order to get the function palette, you have to right click at the block diagram part. Uh. And also earlier, I showed you this thing called the quick drop, right? Control space, you can type in the quick drop function. Alright, so maybe what I can show you is uh, on going switching back to uh, lab view side. Okay, so this is called the code part. Uh. So basically, if you right click on your mouse, right, you go to structures, you can put in different types of uh, structures and your codes will go in here, uh, all your different functions. Eh. So maybe if I put a for loop here, then I'll just put a for loop that encloses this part or I can put a while loop over here. And I can have a while loop. Okay, so these are some examples that I would like to share. Now, moving along in this next uh, PowerPoint slide, okay, we try to dissect the component of for this particular source code uh, in this following slides. So this is a typical uh, functional lab view block diagram for continuous voltage measurement application. Uh, as you can see over here, it was a, it's a sample code yeah, given by NI. So it has several components. It has the user e interface handling, which is this part here. You have the events processing. It uses this thing called the events structure. And it has the ability to do things in parallel because they are two separate while loops and uh, they are multi-threaded data transfer because it also uses a more slightly more advanced tool called the uh, queue function, right? Queue mechanism where you can pass data from one thread to the next trap and of course it offers to do some signal analysis i think this case is the some fft part over here right some fft uh, processing okay so just a quick glance of this code over here so basically it's a producer a consumer type of uh, architecture very simple type of architecture 
So technically you have the, if I were to zoom in, uh, so the top part here, the event handling mes message producer is the UI thread. Uh. So basically this thread handles events from the front panel. So there could be in instances where the user clicks on the button, like a stop button and so on. Eh. Right, so the program will handle that thread. And because these two are while wow loops, right, they are two asynchronous thread as well. They are running because there's uh, no data is passed between the entities, they just execute in parallel, right? And however, they use the uh, queue mechanism, which is a slightly more complex uh, mechanism for data transfer, data communications uh, yeah, between the loops. Eh. And the bottom thread here is the data acquisition state machine, uh, simple state machine architecture. This is called the consumer, uh, consumer, uh, consumer design pattern here. Alright, so uh, it uses, this is the DAQ thread. Uh, so basically this thread interacts with data acquisition hardware as well. Uh. So any block entity that contains code within is called a structure in the lab view uh, context. Right, so uh, moving along. Okay. So uh, the execution control structures. Okay, so I will talk, share a little bit about the loops. Uh. So over here, we got, uh, as you can see on my top right hand side here, we have this thing called the for loops. Okay. And uh, we also at the bottom here, we got this thing called the while wow loops. Eh? All right. Which is pretty common eh, in programming paradigm. Eh? So in the context of the lab view for loop, right, we have this thing called the count terminal n. So over here, you can define a number, okay, on how many times the for loop will execute, eh? okay, within this for loop itself. So it will generally execute n number of times over here, right? As you can see, so currently it's at 1000, so you iterate 1000 times. Then uh, at the same time, we also have this thing called the loop iteration terminal, which is signified by the small little uh, uh, lowercase i there for iteration counter. So basically it will count how many times the loop has executed. So this thing also appears at the while loop itself. While loop also has this uh, loop iteration terminal count. Now besides that for the while loop, uh, there is also this thing called the conditional terminal here. As you can see here, there's a terminal here in which uh, for the while loop to stop, uh, you have to uh, pass, re pass a return value or run with a value true to it. Okay, to uh, terminate this while loop uh, for this example. Alright, so uh, now for loops and while loops have uh, an iteration terminal to display, as I mentioned, how many times it will execute. So uh, while loop must execute at least once, right? You execute, uh, but for for loops, uh, it can execute zero times, uh, right? It cannot. And the, the one of the important thing also to note is that the iteration terminal here is zero index. Uh, means that it starts from zero, even for the first iteration, it will start from zero and you will count up. So maybe just a quick, uh, uh, quick uh, check for the audience. Uh, maybe uh, for example, if I have a for loop over here, and we can see that the end count is set to a thousand, right? So what do you think is the iteration loop iteration terminal output? It will be from zero to yeah nine 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 correct okay so it's thousand minus one so it's nine 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 hundred ninety nine so you iterate from zero to nine hundred and ninety nine all right so that is for the for loop now a quick short question over here now we have uh, two simple uh, 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 so-called loop structure here. One is a for loop and one is a while loop as you can see over here. So the small little question here is that now what do you think would be the output now if the question says yeah after when the program below is executed now what is what is the expected uh, output? Maybe uh, later on we have a chance to try to build this quickly. Uh. Okay uh, in uh, lab view itself. So maybe for now, let's try and put on a thinking cap and try and see what do you think could be the, the answer. Is it A, is it B or is it C? Right, so something for you to take a look.
Okay, so maybe uh, let, let's like illustrate uh, over here. Now, for the for loops case, right? Okay, uh, but for your info, information that this uh, thing that you see over here is called the shift register, by the way. So a small little table here just to quickly analyze the, the data uh, count uh, or data flow. Because the count terminal is set to 1, right? So basically, this for loop will only execute once, right? which that is very clear. Now, uh, so what happened is that uh, it uses this thing called a shield register. Shield register is basically like a memory device. So the shield register is initially initialized to zero. So, uh, and we would expect the iteration, uh, uh, the loop iteration count will count from, start from zero, right? So if you see this little table here, where n is the number, okay, one, okay, uh, will the stop condition be met on the first iteration? Uh, actually answer is no because the your n must be greater than the input nah. so that means you will run the first round first and what happened is that it will also perform the operation the addition operation so 0 plus the 1 right to give me a value of uh, 1 right and it will be stored in the sheet register here so the iteration value will show 0 right so as a matter of fact uh, if the the value uh, if you um, it will check the conditions to see whether the stop conditions have met. All right. So, uh, in fact, uh, the stop condition will be met. Uh, okay. Uh, during the next part. Uh, because the for loop actually will only run once. Uh. Okay. The for loop will only execute once. So, in fact, technically, it will not execute the second one. Because you reset the end as one. So, you only execute one iteration and it actually stops there. Right, so the iteration value here will indicate zero. Right, now uh, let's go and check out the while loop itself. So, uh, okay, for the while loop case, uh, okay, so basically you have you, it's pretty much the same. You you are trying to add one count to it, one value from the initial value is zero. So upon the first iteration, right, the 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 output of the add function will show a value of one here, right, and the iteration count will indicate zero right the first uh, like as i mentioned earlier so now it will compare zero is it equals to one answer is no so it will proceed with another iteration so uh, it will add from the previous value of one now it will be one plus another one it will be two right the, the sum value here will be two now the iteration count val counter value will be one right one is equals to one and it will terminate the condition is yes and it will terminate the while loop so your answer should be c right so maybe just to uh, illustrate and uh, convince you uh, so maybe what i have i will just quickly uh, call out yeah this little program of mine so i'm going to minimize this part and just show you Okay, let's maximize this. So basically, I've, uh, I'm going to do control E. Now, I think maybe uh, we'll probably save our time for, to do the other exercise. Uh. So uh, for now, maybe just to demonstrate how this thing will work. So the, in lab view itself, there's also this thing called the highlight execution, which is uh, pretty important as you can see. Here, let me zoom it in for you. This is the code that I've constructed in lab view. Right, so you can uh, create Turn on the highlight execution mode. Right. So when you run the highlight execution, you can see the the flow of the data, which I think is a very neat idea, neat thing to do. So you can see that the the for loop will execute, yeah, and the while loop will also execute at the same time. So the for loop sum is one, while the uh, while loop sum output now uh, here will be two, and the iteration is uh, zero. Okay. So in respect to that, uh, this is answer is C la. Okay, answer is C. Now, uh, just to do a quick comparison between uh, text loop and their lab view equivalents. Okay, as you can see over here. So these on the left hand side are all the uh, text based um, language, probably in C plus plus, and you can have the equivalent of that in in using the lab view component. Okay. So it's pretty much the same. And, uh, what I mean is that in terms of the functionality, it's the same. Uh, but the way they 
code it is different. Uh. One is a uh, text based, the other one is a graphical approach. Now the next thing I'd like to share with you is on this thing called the event and the case structure. Okay, so uh, over here I have the uh, event structure. So which is uh, an event is basically a a type of uh, structure that is able to handle. Uh, yes, the ability to handle uh, so called like um, user uh, e uh, user um, events. So probably something like uh, maybe a user clicks on the front panel on a stop button or other buttons here as well. It will trigger an event structure to, to act on it, right? And of course, over here at the bottom, we have this thing called the case structure, right? Where you can, you can have the codes that you can place within the case structure itself. So, uh, okay, so I think if we do a comparison, back-to-back -back comparison, neck-to-neck -neck comparison between the text-based type and the lab view equivalents, uh, this is what you would see. Lah. So, uh, yeah, in the C programming thing, I think they use uh, event handler as well. Uh, click, right? So this is what you will do in lab view. Then if you use the if condition then statement, we have the case structure that can handle that using the lab view format. And also, of course, you got the switch case, uh, switch, yes. And then lab view also can do it in the using the case structure form. Okay, so let's uh, explore a little bit on the lab view block diagram. So uh, what this slide entails is that it has the same uh, program, uh, the producer consumer code that we uh, that I've shared with you earlier. So it, this one gives a little bit more uh, detail. Yeah, so this is the event structure. This is, you have two while wow loops and you also have a case structure here. Alright, so if you want to take a look and dwell deeper into this, these are called, when you see something that is uh, yellow in color, right? So it's called the uh, sub-VIs. Uh. So basically they are the native part of the G language. Eh? And these are the codes that you cannot modify, alright? Because it's the lowest level of the lab view primitive. Eh? And whereas uh, over here, okay, you can see that these are the functions, which I'll show it with you shortly when I switch over to the lab view side. And uh, over here, we have the so-called the standard functions. Now, these are what we call the sub-VIs that were created either by user or by NI, or maybe it could be a driver that you can probably still add, do some changes to it. All right. Uh, and maybe let me share with you this, then I will... Uh, switch over to lab view. Now the lab view functions may be simple to, to be as complex as you need. So the in in NI National Instruments actually provided us with this thing called the uh, Express VI. They are shown something like this over here. So they are quick and easy to use. Uh, you can do some configuration, but you may not have very little, very, very limited customization that you can do. Then you also have the second level of VIs or what we call the regular VIs as shown over here. So uh, there is there is some uh, it hides some of the unnecessary details, but and you also has some flexibility and power that you can use it. And of course, the one that I like to use are the low level VIs. They are very powerful, flexible, uh, but more time consuming to construct for different uh, users, uh, different application, different users. So it depends on uh, what you want to do. Alright, so understanding the sub VI uh, function behavior. So uh, now this is a typical context help. Maybe let me share with you on here. Let me see. Okay, I have. Okay, so let me switch over to lab view. I'm going to close this and probably just, uh, okay, open up this. Okay, just delete away this one. Okay, right. So we're just going to do tile left and right. Control T. Okay, so I have the uh, lab view now. You can always drag and drop any some functions. Maybe uh, over let's say some of these yeah functions like this or maybe this one here. Okay, so like just now we I turn on the label. Now what just now I mentioned to you this was a uh, lab view primitive. Uh, this is a this one wait millisecond function. Now you can always 
if you're unsure about that function you can always hover your mouse to this thing called the context help which i find it quite useful click on the context help window you can mouse over on the object maybe you can try that now everyone maybe you open up a blank vi yes you can mouse over this now what you can see is that uh, over here now i think also one of the nice things about lab view is that uh, there is a back-end uh, lab view engine that is running that is a compiler that is checking your code as you are developing which i think is quite nice so you can see that currently uh, i have broken arrow over here right because the code is incomplete of course and i didn't do very much but uh but obviously uh, if you click on this broken arrow it will prompt to you what is the error okay it says that your this in this block diagram the wait millisecond uh timer right contains unwired or bad terminal which is not connected right yes so how do we also check that you can always click on the show error he will direct you to the error itself so if you mouse back to here on the context help now you will see something over here right you will see that the in the context help window the uh the the text here has been is bold uh, you can see the inputs to this wait millisecond wait, wait millisecond to wait is a bold text here now in lab view right the, the bold text mean it is a required input eh. okay that means it's an input that you can you can further click on this yeah it is a required input eh. That is bold. If you don't put it right, then let view will will uh be unhappy eh, and give you error. Right, so you have to right click. Maybe let's create a constant to it. Okay, so once you you eliminate the error, right? Yeah, the broken error will go away. So you see, because I've already tied in a constant to this, and therefore resulting in the error disappearing. So if I switch you back to my uh, PowerPoint slide here yeah you can see that required inputs are bold right if you don't put in this channel for this particular uh, deck MX timing uh, API right BI okay it will not work okay so anything that is bold you must you must supply an input to it now let's understand a little bit on the application hierarchy now if you double click on the non primitive sub bi opens that function so let's take a look now you will see that uh, the sub bi itself uh, you can double click again you see the front panel and itself has another code all right so uh, every sub bi can be a every vi can be a sub vi all right and every and do remember that every sub vi has its own front panel and block diagram itself Okay. Uh, moving along, uh, managing the application resource in larger LabVIEW application. Now there is this thing called the LabVIEW Project Explorer. Okay, maybe let's try and do this together. So let me close this first. Close my LabVIEW. All right. Uh, okay. So over here, I'm gonna close this as well. Huh? Okay, close this part here, and I will show you now in LabVIEW itself, right? If I were to open up this, uh, okay, yeah, let's tidy up a little bit. Okay, now what I can see there is this thing called uh, create project. Eh? Okay, so let's try and do that. So I want you to click on this uh, create project. Okay, so what you can see is that uh, let me will ask you uh, what do you want to do over here when you start to create a project. Now, this is very useful if you have, uh, especially if you've got hardware targets. Uh, Okay, this one you have to use the Project Explorer to, 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 to manage that. So there are things like blank project, okay, uh, state machines and other types of frameworks that are already available. Okay, so maybe uh, don't do this, let me show you. Let's say for example, if I, have, if I want to start off with some templates, never ever start with a blank template, uh, it will be difficult. Eh? Right, so start with some basic templates. Maybe let's take a look at this one. So let me just show you. You can click on this. Right, then uh, once you click on that, right, which I did, I click on this, I click next. Huh? Right, I have they ask me to enter these things over here. Right, so what I do is uh, probably, okay, I will just, uh, just change, I will just put it on my desktop. 
Okay, maybe I'll just create a call it a test folder, right? Then I will double click on this and select the current folder. Uh, and it's just we just call it untitled project one. That's fine. Just click finish. Okay, and uh, it will create that project. Uh, built from the template and you have a so-called uh, template project that is there so what you see is that in lab view this is called the uh, project explorer all right so if i double click on this uh, main vi all right you will be able to see something like this right and if i click run it will show you can click the start you will see you will generate some uh, sine wave uh, for this continuous uh, measurement data logger as you can see over here so then i can click stop so if you do examine the code is a typical lab view code now don't be overwhelmed by these codes over here it's just a sample uh, sample code eh. all right so i'm going to exit and i'm going to close this Alright, so basically LabVIEW allow us to handle our projects yeah, using a project explorer which is pretty neat. Alright, so it helps us to do yeah, some of these benefits as you can see over here. We can organize our application resource uh, and so on. We, have, we can build libraries, build executable installers and so on. Alright, so it is recommended that we start, yeah, never start a LabVIEW project from scratch. Always start from something, right? It could be a simple state machine project can you click clearly what you want to do all right and you can also add on custom templates and so on all right so let's explore the uh, lab view block diagram further right so uh, under just now the same producer and the consumer template right we have this uh, input terminal right this input terminal is uh, just a boolean right uh, you can tell whether it is a control or indicator by examining the direction it faces which i thought it could be quite useful lah. you can see over here you see this black arrow tip right yeah it's shown to uh, indicate on facing the right hand side yes to indicate that it's a control all right and then of course i also have the the, the other side the, the other facing of the terminal as well for this uh, indicator you have these two black arrow tip that is on the left hand side so the data is flowing in and it signifies is an indicator all right these are constants all right constants are shown as this all right these are constant let view constants you can see and these are wires all right which is quite obvious like the colors of the or wires must be and strictly enforced at any time Okay, so moving along, we in terms of lab view, there are different data types. Uh, you can see uh, you have floating data types, integer, you have boolean, string, and also other error codes. Different color means different things. And then we have the uh, array. Okay, now arrays are pretty common things that we often use in lab view. Now in the array are uh, index zero base. Uh, okay, so this is a dimension of a one D an array you have 2d array and so on so maybe i think it is a good time to just uh, share with you an example maybe all of us can uh, uh, open a blank vi everybody start uh, open a blank vi okay so let's take a look here i've created some pre-built uh, vi uh, just to share okay so we'll try to make a for loop all right uh, for 1d array and then we can try to make a 2d array as well okay so maybe let's start for you guys let's start with a blank vi okay let's start with a blank vi All right so something like this and i'm going to press ctrl t to tile left and right so maybe to begin right you do is that you can right click on your control palette okay uh navigate to this thing called the uh, container data containers right look for this thing called the array so you can drag and drop this container inside so now currently the container is not defined so what i'm going to do is and i'm going to right click go to numeric look for this thing called the numeric control oops sorry go to the look for this thing called the uh, numeric control so i'm going to drag this numeric control into the block diagram into the container itself right 
okay so I've created this array uh, container with a value that, that is holding the double floating precision number all right so what we are do is that we try to create something like a function as I have over here so maybe this is what we are do okay so maybe I'll let you try uh, but uh, in this in my examples here I've actually defined uh, i32 uh, okay so how do we change the data type okay it's pretty simple currently what you see over here uh, my array uh, I'm gonna minimize this yeah my array itself is a uh, double float precision right so what you can do is you can select this uh, the inside the data type go to representation change it to i32 so let me show you again you can right click go to representation change it to i32 let me zoom in, in for you all right so you can see the data type has changed right so what i'm going to do is also i would like to add a for loop around it and i will pass this data into the for loop as shown over here okay so uh, let's take a look where we are okay we are looking at the array function okay so uh, let me see okay so here we are so we have uh, something like here okay I just want to display the uh, content of this uh, array okay one by one Right, so you can see over here. So what I do is that I will come to my block diagram. I'm going to right click and create an indicator. All right, sorry. So uh, it is called the uh, numeric, not a control over here. There's a mistake here. It should be called a numeric indicator. Okay. Yeah. So this is what I have. Yeah. Okay. So it's called a numeric indicator right so this is a 1d array you can type that 1d array and this is called a numeric indicator okay so uh, and of course i can right click on this uh, iter loop iteration counter terminal here and create indicator So now what I have is this pretty simple one. So basically, currently my array is uh, this one D array over here is not defined. Uh. So I would need your help. Okay, I need you to uh, populate. Go to the bottom right hand corner as you can see over here, and uh, drag. Uh. Uh, maybe we try drag, drag it this way. Okay, sorry. So you can see that I have an array. Right, as you can see, and uh, in my sample code, I have indicated some numbers. Uh, so it's like 5, 3, and 1. Okay, so let's try and do that. Now, don't worry about the decimal point first. Uh, 5, 3, and you can always change the precision of that later. So if I were to uh, switch on the highlight execution and run it, you will see that there are three elements being passed out. Okay. So you can see he will show you five, yeah, three and then one, as you can see over here. So what technically is happening is that uh, because there is this thing called the uh, auto indexing, yeah, yeah, it has been enabled. So what happened is that the array of value noticed also the difference in the the wire, the wire uh, thickness. One is a thicker wire, the other one is a thinner wire. Right, thinner is a scalar value. This is an array. Right, so I've basically created. Uh, uh, wait, let me call this thing. Uh, this is a numeric counter. Counter, sorry. It's called a counter. All right, so let's call this counter. Maybe I will just uh, resize it a bit larger so that uh, participants can see it. Okay, so you can see over here. I have the uh, yeah, numerical indicator this is the counter value and I will try to uh, increase a bit of this 
dimension here. Yeah. Okay. So basically, I have an array of three elements. All right. I have an array of three elements. Yeah. With each individual element, uh, element five, element three, and element one. Eh? So when I run this with the highlight execution uh, switch on, you will see that the values of this array of three elements is being passed to the for loop and it iterates one by one. And you can see the numerical display 5, 3 and 1, right? So the values are being passed in one by one. And as we know that the counter value is uh, uh, counter the is index 0 index, right? So you 0, 1, 2. So you run execute three times, right? So that is the function for a single 1D array, right? So, uh, okay, so for the concept of a 2D array, it's pretty much the same. You, if you encase uh, two four loops, one on top of the other inside, right, within, you will generate a, a 2D array, as you can see over here. Right, so uh, this is an example of a 2D array. So initially, uh, maybe let's try and construct that as well. So we go back to our this function here all right so we'll try to uh, do a simple 2d array okay so what you do is that uh, if we strictly follow the diagram over here maybe you want to take a quick picture of this using your phone or something so that uh, and then you can construct this very quickly eh? shouldn't take you too long eh? how what this uh, 2d array function so basically Maybe if I were to explain briefly, uh, it is a it's a nested for loop. You have uh, uh, one outer for loop and then there's an inner for loop. So basically, what it does is that it creates uh, a two D array with four rows. With the outer for loop with the number four there indicates it's going to generate four rows and six columns. Eh? As you can see over here, because it's a nested for you will always look uh, the outside and first, then followed by the in, in the internal for loop here. So it's going to have an array of six, uh, an array of four rows and six columns. Eh. Okay, so how do we do that in uh, lab view? That's pretty simple. Let's try that. So I'm going to leave this uh, for loop up here for your reference. Okay, this one I'm going to I'm going to just create one that is at the bottom here. So what you do is that you can use the control space to get the quick drop function. Just to recap, right? Quick drop is sometimes quite useful. So you can type the word for, right? So it will show you the uh, the for loop function appears. So you double click on this, you have a for loop. Now one quick way to duplicate uh, things in lab view is that you can select the object, press the control key and drag. Right, so you basically what I did was okay, just show you again. You select the function that you want to duplicate, hold on to the control key on your keyboard, left click on your mouse, and you drag. Right, so what I did was I've created a, a nested for loop as shown. So earlier, uh, let's uh, mouse over the input here and uh, right click create constant. Right, so we put a 4 here, right click, create a constant here, we put a 6 here. Right, and also we want to put a, um, a random number generator over here. So where do we get it? We go to the numeric palette, right, go to the random num 0 to 1. So select and drop within the inner for loop as shown. Uh, okay. Right, so what you do is that you can uh, right click on this visible item label and then you can wire this through here and here to the input as shown over here. Right, okay. Okay, so and then uh, what you do, you can right click on the output here and create an indicator. Right, so generally you have just successfully created a 2D array. So let me show you here to the array which I'm going to label right and uh, let's try to uh, execute this thing here okay so I'm going to just click run normal run yes I will generate a 2d array ok 
Okay, as you can see, yeah, uh, it is uh four rows by six column. Uh, if you allow me to expand it, yeah, okay, so it's gonna be uh yeah, four rows. Four rows as shown by six columns, eh, right? So you have a 2D array. Yeah, okay, so this is it. Yeah, so maybe we will try to make a, the next exercise one uh, where we will do a simple dice roller application, right? Where we will create a level application generating a random dice. So maybe as an exercise, maybe I'll let you try. Open a blank VI, okay? Uh, locate these functions in your lab view. First of all, Okay, locate the uh the numer from the same numerical palette. Okay, uh, look for multiply function. So we, what we need is three elements, three things here. Number one is the random number generator, which is this one here. You need a multiply function, and also you want to round it towards to a positive number using this function here. Okay, so maybe you can help me. You can use the quick drop method to uh, get these functions eh? okay so let's maybe show you very quickly uh, this random dice okay so what i'm going to do is i'll close let me see should i close this yeah this is a blank vi eh? so i'm just going to close this one here i'm not going to save i'm going to close this i'm going to close this as well and i will just open a new vi Okay, and then uh, Control T to tile left and right. So what you're going to do is uh, you're going to generate this uh, random dice uh, using a for loop, right? A for loop here with the row count as well. So it's pretty simple. You right click to structures, go to the for loop. Okay, then you right click over here, create a control, right? And we can easily just uh, label this as the row count, right? That's how they mentioned it was this thing called the row count. Okay. Row count. Yep. And uh, I will put the random dice num numeric here. And I will also switch on the label, uh, the visible label. Now I can use control space to get the quick drop. And it's called round to, to towards infinity positive infinity right so just double click on this function through the use of a uh, quick drop i'm going to multiply right so maybe let's try use quick drop control plus use the uh, multiply function double click so then take this uh, times i think it's a 10 right create a constant of 10 Oh, sorry, 6, sorry, 0 to 6, right? Yes, and uh, multiply this to here and wire this to the output as shown over here and right-click create an indicator. So this, uh, and also, let's take a look here. Yeah, it is uh, for loop. So if you were to run, you will generate an array of the number of uh, random Gen randomly generated dice number uh, depending on what count you set to okay so let's switch you back to lab view so let's take a look here so if i were to expand this right so i should be able to see say for example like this so let's say maybe you can try this i'm going to run this four count so when i run this you will generate randomly some random uh, dice with four counts eh? as you can see over here right okay so that concludes this uh, exercise if you have any question feel free to ask uh, but let's move on to the next one now uh, next example I will explain briefly what is the difference between the chart versus the graph using uh, now graph are basically uh, uh, display for data display that uh, usually will as you can see over here now it will it will tend to be a little bit like Excel uh, if you want to chart something in Excel you have to 
record you have to have all the data ready and then you chart it straight right so in lab view the the analogy is pretty much the same in graph right the data are only updates once eh? all at one, all at one go right so for example over here you got this simple code here what you're trying to do is that we are trying to generate a sine wave eh? right so what it does it generates a uh, hundred points because this as you can see over here is a for loop with hundred points so right we are going to generate a uh, sine wave with hundred points inside within the for loop because it uses the for loop and with the uh, auto index enable the graph gets displayed only after this 100 iterations is completed eh, and you generate a waveform graph all right so slightly difference between a waveform chart is that the chart is charge indicator is actually placed inside the loop for, in, for instance in this case you have a wow loop the chart is placed inside right and the chart points are updated it for every iteration eh. Every iteration it will update one point. Every iteration it updates one point. Every iteration it updates one point and so on. So it's more live like in a sense. Eh? Right? Versus the but it has the different applications as well. Alright. And besides charge versus graph, there's also other types like multi plots, uh, uh, XY graph, eh? where you can generate things like different types of uh, graph depending on the needs. Uh? Yeah. So, uh, okay, right. Okay, so this is an example of an X, Y. And also for the chart, there's the different types of uh, update modes. Uh. You have the strip chart, scope chart, and also the sweep chart. Uh. Okay, these are the different uh, modes of, ana uh, of analysis. Uh. So by default, it's the strip chart. Uh. So you update point by point. Uh. Yeah. Of course, you also got the scope chart and the sweep chart, which uh, display significantly faster than the strip chart. Uh, Alright. Okay. So, uh, you need to, in the... Yeah, okay. So, for example, you have a question here, right? You need to add a graph indicator to here. So, which of the following best graphical indicator would you consider using? Will it be a waveform graph uh, waveform chart intensity chart or xy graph right so uh, obviously you can see over here yeah it should be a waveform graph eh, because it's a, it's a good choice because it will you will display multiple points at one go right because having said that your this data type uh, that is coming out uh, all right is uh let me see it can display a uh, waveform graph uh, let's say yeah because you may be collecting a series of uh, set of data number of samples you see in this uh, example here you may set a certain number of samples that you want to collect at one go then you do some conversion and then you pass out right so waveform graph is uh, quite the choice uh. Now earlier, I think we already talked about this when I show you this thing called the highlight execution, which is quite a neat way for troubleshooting. Uh, you can, uh, yeah, you can press the start right when you switch on the the light bulb. I call it the light bulb. Uh, you can be able to see the flow of the data uh, in your lab view example. All right. So, uh, in this next exercise two, we are going to simulate and plot a uh, signal. So uh, the time to complete is about 25 minutes. So it depends on what, how we do it. But the block diagram, the front panel looks something like this where you have the waveform chart. Okay, you can select the sine wave and we can adjust the amplitude and the frequency. All right. So if we just run through very quickly, the final product looks something like this. So we are going to use this thing called the simulate signal and we are going to display a waveform chart over here okay so let's try and do this together this is the last uh, activity last exercise so I'm going to just help you out here so I'm going to close this all right if you want you can save uh, but I, I'm just going to just do a, open a new VI and I'm going to tell left and right right so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a bit of the quick drop here I'm going to use the while loop 
Wow. Oke. Okay. Wow. Wow. Oke. Okay. Oh, oke. Okay. So maybe uh, it doesn't quite reckon. Okay, I'm going to do the structures. I'm going to select a wow loop. Now you can try that. Right click, create a control for the stop button. Maybe I could also include a little weight millisecond over here. Okay, and uh, I'm going to right click and add a small constant here. So maybe say 100 millisecond. Now where do I get the simulate uh, this function, a simulate signal uh, express VI? So I'm going to switch you back to lab view. I'm going to do control space bar and I'm going to type simulate signal oh doesn't quite get there huh? okay uh, wait let me see huh? okay so right click okay never mind I'm going to go to my signal okay wait I mean I'm gonna go to my express palette express and I'm going to say uh, let me see I'm gonna look for this thing called Hang on a minute. Uh, input. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's under the inputs. Ah, uh, call the simulate signal. Okay, you're just gonna drag and drop over here. Now over here, you can simulate the waveform that we want. Uh. So I'm gonna keep the inputs as sine wave. Uh, okay, set everything as default. I'm gonna click OK. Right now, you can uh, add the amplitude so what you're going to do i need you to mouse over the amplitude right click create control or okay you create okay but you see what it happens that by default they will create for you numeric uh control maybe what we want is not it's not so nice maybe let's try and right click go to the numeric and let's select a knob okay you're going to drag a knob and i'm going to call this uh, say frequency Okay, I'm going to call this frequency and uh, just going to resize it a bit larger for you to see. So I'm going to have something like that. Frequency. Now you can help me with that. You can bring the frequency. I'm going to duplicate uh, to make things a bit easier. I'm going to select this object, press to the control key and then drag. Alright, and I'm going to call this the uh, amplitude frequency and amplitude right so I'm gonna wire this uh, uh, freak amplitude to here and the frequency into here right so you can always use this button called the uh, cleanup diagram which will nicely clean up your code right and I'm going to say put a XY graph so I'm going to go to my graph uh, sorry waveform chart right so i'm going to put a waveform chart over here right sorry the diagram is a little bit big and i might maybe let's reduce this a little bit right yeah okay sorry this one here okay so i've got a waveform chart that i would like to put it in and i'm going to wire has shown yeah okay yeah that's it so i'm going to try and run this yep because currently I don't have a frequency, maybe I'm gonna add some frequency, couple of amplitude. Yeah, so this is what I'm gonna have once it is uh, completed. Control tab, right, to see the waveform. So you should see something like this. So you click run, you can generate the sign pretty seamlessly done. I would I would imagine, right? So you got the sine wave completely completed. Right, so that's my exercise tool. Lah, okay, so uh, we've done quite a fair bit. Lah. So we have, uh, let me see. Oops. Okay, so let me see. I'm going to take a look. Lah. Let's see where I am now. Okay, I'm going to, yeah, move this down. Okay, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think... Uh, 
Okay, uh, so maybe just try to summarize and wrap up. So basically today, we uh, and of course, you we, there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, now, I think in the interest of time, it is not possible to do more detailed stuff, right? Like, for example, you can do further and deep analysis. You can hook it up to external code integration. You can visualize more complex visualization, 3D visualization. And also, you can do some... Uh, automated reporting uh, for your data. So today, to wrap up, uh, we've introduced to you the basics of uh, some basics lab view and also the uh, rich uh, ecosystem that it has. Uh, to be honest, I think, yes, there are many There are many things out there. There are the lab view tools network. There's also a large user community. And there's also a lot of the tools, uh, modules and toolkits. Eh that are available right so i think i hope you have uh, uh, learned a bit uh, on the uh, lab view part okay there's a whole range of things uh, and of course if you are not sure of course we have the ni colleagues here to be able to help us answer some of the questions uh, which you may have so far any questions uh? Uh, if not, uh, maybe I'd like to just uh, finally wrap up with some sharing uh, of some of the student projects that we have that done or under my so-called uh, mentor mentorship. Uh, yeah, we at the School of Engineering here in Poly. So just to share that uh, we have several of these projects. Maybe I'll just share some of them here. Uh, one of these projects was done by my student quite recently on a project entitled uh, Time Sensitive Networking Project. Uh, this project was also uh, showcased at the uh, ITEP, uh, yeah, quite recently at the Asia Pacific ITEP, and uh, you can see over here in this picture, I have my student Devin, who presented this project to the uh, DPM uh, Taman Shamugaranam, right? Who was the GOH, I guess, of honor in this project. So what this project does basically, uh, it is a collaboration with an uh, NI as well, uh, and some of the work was uh, in discussion with ARTC, uh, ASTAR. So with the evolution on moving forward for the uh, Industry 4.0, right, uh, many, I think some of the companies who are in the mainstream or the automation business, they would like to see, uh, uh, because in the factory automation conditions, you have many, say, robotic arms and so on. There are, there are many different types of uh, data communication protocol. You have profit bus, you have Ethercat, okay, you have Modbus and other types of uh, communication buses, eh? uh, Modbus, TCP, IP and so on. Now, so, uh, and of course, you, in, on, on top of that, you also have your IT network, lah, right? So, IT meaning all your uh, your PC communication to internet and so on. Eh? So, you have, uh, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of a need to be able to have uh, a, a convergence of this OT, what we call OT, uh, OT are like machine to machine and IT networks uh, on sharing on the same internet uh, uh, using the IEEE 802.1 standard. Uh. So basically, this project was a showcase uh, uh, to try to demonstrate the, the NI uh, TSN um, application. Uh. So what they have here is uh, what you what you can see is pretty small here, but you can kind of see uh, what we have is a setup where we have a, mo a geared motor. We have two uh, uh, two uh, compact reel, one master, one slave, one master, one slave, and also we have an industrial controller that is con uh, there's a vision camera here, and also there is a Cisco router, TSN enabled Cisco router system here. So what we were trying to do, maybe I'll show you over here, yeah, correct. So the idea is that to try to uh, showcase or to demonstrate the use of this uh, TSN network where we have a scenario where we share the network uh, uh, using the standard Ethernet cable, right? So uh, we in this demonstration, uh, they were trying to uh, control the motion of the gear motor. So we have a uh, sending the commands from the master uh, master compact rail to the slave eh, to coordinate the motion eh, and also having a vision camera overseeing this uh, gear motion eh, right so and at the same time if we uh, enable the TSN 
uh, so we have the TSN and the not TSN. Uh, okay, so and then we try to flood the data network. Okay, using a streamer PC. Uh, okay, so we try to stream high volume of uh, video content over the network, and we see whether the there is a loss of synchronization. Uh, yeah, which it does uh, without the TSN. But with TSN, you can have very deterministic and time synchronized uh, coordination uh, of the gear without even with the high volume of traffic of the data that is streams through the same network. So that was one of the projects that we did. Uh, another project is on a Santosa Siloso Beach uh, Wormery project. So basically, uh, before I click, there's a short video clip I want to share with you. But uh, what it does is that we try to help uh, some uh, industries as well uh, to automate certain processes. So in Sentosa Siloso Beach Resort, they have this wormery where they, uh, they are eco-friendly resort. Uh, basically, they have, uh, I think you know that worms, worm, worms are very good uh, decomposter. Uh, right? So basically, uh, the restaurant is very eco-friendly. They actually collected the waste food and they feed the wormery. So what uh, you'll be thinking what our students do. Our students were students created using LabVIEW a, an automated uh, habitat monitoring system for them. Uh. Oh, so maybe I share you this short video clip. Ma. You may have visited Saloso Beach Resort on Sentosa before. Well, but did you know that uh, its permanent residents include earthworms? Yes, the resort has a wormery housing about a million earthworms. They're not pets. Every month, they chomp down a whopping 700 kilos of food waste from the hotel kitchen and turn it into ha and turn it into half that amount of poo, which is mixed into soil as organic fertilizer to grow plants and vegetables. The resulting veggies meet 20% of the resort's needs. And now the worms have an automated care system. It keeps them happy by probing their habitat to ensure that it's moist enough and not too acidic. If there's a problem, the keepers of the worms are alerted by SMS. The resort worked with Neon Polytechnic on the prototype. Yeah, okay. So this is just another project that we did with... Uh, 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 this uh, Sentosa Siloso Beach Resort. Uh. Now, other projects that we did also, we have student-led participation in the various uh, technical symposium organized by NIS, and we involve our students to be very proactive in their learning, uh, and they actually come up with some creative projects which were showcased during the uh, uh, the NI events. Uh. So we have, for example, the LabVIEW Automated Tank System for Teaching and Learning, and also some student, uh, one of the students, uh, created the LabVIEW Wind Turbine Trainer Kit Monitoring System uh, just to share. Now in addition to that, we have the six-month uh, final year project students that uh, works on different different projects using the LabVIEW platform. Uh, for example, we work on a Smart E recycling system that were created by these two students uh, and uh, they will submitted their project ideas for the HDB Cool Ideas competition. Uh. Now, besides that, uh, we also involve, we have uh, expertise and projects that works on energy control and monitoring system through the use of the Modbus uh, RTU comms uh, and profile analysis. Uh, this was done by students yeah, uh, under our supervision. Uh, so we come up and also we have uh, VSD control, so using uh, LabVIEW control the various, uh, the, the, to monitor the different energy meters and uh, all through Modbus and also for this project uh, one of my students Harry yeah he works very hard on this project and he actually uses the uh, another separate PLC controller and he uses the LabVIEW OPC uh, communication to obtain the data and do analysis uh. right so uh, okay then we have another project that uses the port portable medical dispenser using the NI MyReal project Okay, so this one was uh, doing a standalone system. The idea was to create a standalone type of medical dispensing uh, unit for hospital use, uh, for post hospital use. So this is a typical the prototype of the system that the students did. It was a standalone uh, my real project uh, that communicates with a uh, server. So in an example of the state transition diagram, students have to design uh, their lab view codes using uh, some um, method methodology and there are various others uh, projects 
that our students are doing every semester. So with that, I think I would like to take the opportunity to thank you and also thank NI for giving me this opportunity to share with you and I hope you have benefited from this session. And uh, if you have any question, we can feel free to ask and I thank you very much. Thank you.